by texting town hall, the words town hall, to the number 44321. Relatedly, if you're interested in supporting local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy, say, of Dr. Kelton's book, and let's be honest, if we were gathered together tonight in the Great Hall, nearly everyone would be picking up their copy. Please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through LA Bay Book Company. So buy the book, and when you do, buy it local. All right, then. Dr. Stephanie Kelton is a professor of economics and public policy at the State University of New York at Stony Brook and a Bloomberg contributing columnist. Uh, she's been called a prophetic economist and a rock star of progressive economics. By the way, I'm sure Professor Kelton doesn't feel at all weird when people say that in her introductions. <laughs> formerly the chair of the economics department at the university. So uh, what's up? At any rate, formerly the chair of the economics department at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She was a research scholar at the university's Center for Full Employment and Price Stability, uh, as well as uh, serving at the Levy Economics Institute in upstate New York. Stephanie is the founder of the blog, New Economic Perspectives, and a member of the Top Wonks Network of the nation's best thinkers. In 2016, Politico recognized her as one of the 50 people across the country most influencing the political debate. Kelton was the chief economist on the US Senate Budget Committee, it probably goes without saying, staffing the minority, and an advisor to the Bernie 2016 presidential campaign. She's a regular commentator on national radio and television, and her op-eds have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and Bloomberg. In addition to her many academic articles and publications, she is the author of The Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory, and the Birth of the People's Economy, which of course is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Kelton. Thank you very much. And thank you to the people who are uh, joined here um, on this site. And as I understand it, people who are also watching on YouTube and uh, other streaming services. So I'm very, very delighted to have so many of you interested in the book and in the topic. And I noticed in the chat bar just a couple of seconds ago, somebody said, I can't wait to find out what MMT is. So um, I hope that I'm gonna be able to do a lot of that here with you for the next, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes before we open it up to questions. Um, the book is an effort to lay out in much more thoroughgoing uh, fashion the answer to this question about how do I, how should I think about MMT? But let me start by saying that um, I am a macroeconomist and um, that is distinct from being a microeconomist. So we look at the whole economy, the big functioning of the, the macroeconomy. Um, and MMT is an approach, a framework for approaching the questions that are related to the study of macroeconomics. So it is a macroeconomic framework. A lot of you probably know that in economics, there are lots of different schools of thought uh, and MMT has emerged, I think it's safe to say, as um, a, a new uh, paradigm in economics or a new kind of approach or school of thought. So let me talk a little bit about the book and uh, why I wanted to write this book. If you happen to already have a copy, then you might have gotten as far as chapter one, where I uh, tell a little story and I lead with the old television show, Sesame Street. Okay? Everybody is familiar with Sesame Street. I grew up watching it. Um, I say in the book that I would sit with my sister and we would watch that um, segment of Sesame Street that they often did where you know they have a two by two matrix and four images would start appearing on the screen. And they were trying to teach young people to um, categorize things, right? To take things that are similar and push them to one side and then find the, the item that's different or dissimilar from the others and, and identify that one. And the game was called, you know, one of these things is not like the other and the song would go. And so, you know, uh, on the screen would appear a truck and a scooter and a skateboard and a watermelon, right? And so you say, oh, I've got three modes of transportation and, and I have this piece of fruit. So the watermelon, the watermelon's not like the other. And you'd holler it out and play along uh, with the television program. And so basically I never grew up is sort of what's happening here. And I just find myself yelling back at my television screen, even though uh, I'm no longer a child, you know, but I get very frustrated at a lot of the commentary, especially around questions that I take up in this book. And so the title of the book, The Deficit Myth, 
it would be nice if there was just one myth because we could just sort of approach that myth, explain what's wrong and then fix it, right? The problem is there isn't just one myth. There is this web of interrelated myths that get all tangled up in our discourse and whether it's our politicians or the people who host maybe the shows that we watch on Sunday morning and they interview the politicians or it's the newspaper articles or the magazine articles, or the radio programs, it's just pervasive. Uh, the, the things that I think, and I argue in the book, that so many people are just getting fundamentally wrong when it comes to questions of money and taxes and debt and yes, the deficits. Um, and so the book is an attempt to sort of walk readers through the big picture and to kind of correct our thinking. And sometimes uh, MMT economists will often say MMT is a lens. Okay, well, think about what a lens does, right? If you wear prescription lenses, then the idea is that the lens improves your vision, right? It helps you see more clearly. And with MMT, a lot of what we're trying to do is just provide people with better vision, right? With a better picture of how the monetary system that we have today works. And once we get a better understanding of our modern monetary system, we can begin to ask questions like, well, how does that change the government's ability to run policy in the interest of the people? So the subtitle to the book is Modern Monetary Theory and the Birth of the People's Economy. So let's just sort of start chipping away at some of these myths. Um, I say in the book, I start with what I think is the most pernicious of all of the different myths. I take up six in the book. The most pernicious myth, I think, is the myth that the government should run its budget the way that you and I operate our budgets. The government is basically a big household and it should really play by the same rules that you and I play by, okay? We know that um, we have to balance the checkbook every month. We know that we're supposed to watch the amount of money that comes in and the amount of money that goes out, and we're supposed to manage our finances responsibly. And that mostly means trying to keep spending in check where we don't spend everything that we make. Maybe we put something aside and we save. We try to avoid borrowing and taking on too much debt. And the reason is that we know that borrowing can get us into trouble. We start borrowing to finance um, spending beyond what we can afford out of our current income. We have to pay that money back. And, um, you know, we don't want to sock ourselves in with so much debt that we get into a situation where we have bills coming due and we don't have the money to pay the bills. OK, because we could end up missing payments, defaulting on some of our debt, ruin our credit rating. Um, end up, you know, filing for bankruptcy. It can happen. It happens to people all the time. It happens to businesses, okay? It can happen to corporations. It can happen to state and local governments. So we're beginning now. I want to circle back to Sesame Street. And in the book, I put the matrix up with the four pictures. And I ask readers to see that there's something different about the federal government's budget, the federal government's finances. So if you think of, you know, one of these things is not like the other, you and I, households, we have to balance our budgets. We have to live within our means. We can't take on too much debt. Households, businesses, and state and local governments. If you are, you know, paying attention to what's going on in the country today in terms of state budgets and you're listening to governors and mayors across this country beg literally reaching out to this administration to the white house imploring the president to um and, and congress to send aid because state budgets are getting hammered and states are not like the federal government they um, have to live you know, within their means. They are constrained by the amount of money that they can raise in revenue and some limited uh, scope for borrowing. So one of these things is not like the other. The federal government is not like the others. What makes the federal government different? Why are governors asking Congress to send money because they don't have it if everybody's in a jam 
what makes anybody think the federal government can write the check? And the answer is that the federal government is fundamentally different, that it stands in a different relationship vis-a-vis -vis the currency, the dollar, that the federal government of the United States of America is the issuer of our currency. And everybody else is a user of the dollar. So we categorize those, you know, four, we compartmentalize households, businesses, state and local government, put them in one category, users of the currency. The federal government is separate, okay? It's the issuer of the currency. And it has the sole legal authority to issue our currency, the US dollar. The US dollar comes from the US government and it can't legally come from anywhere else. You and I can't create it. If we could, we wouldn't worry about going broke, right? Businesses wouldn't worry. And if states could do it, governors wouldn't bother waiting around for Congress. They would just create the money themselves, but they can't. Only the federal government can issue our currency. So that's obviously a big, big, important point. Okay, and once you recognize that, a lot of other things follow from there. If you could issue your own currency, would you ever worry that you were going to have debts coming due, bills that needed to be paid that you couldn't afford to pay? If the bills were, you know, the payment was due in the currency that you and only you could create? I think pretty clearly the answer is no. Would you worry that there were certain things you couldn't afford if they were priced in dollars and you have the patent, essentially, right, the copyright on the dollar, uh, would you worry about not being able to come up with enough money to meet expenditures, to fund programs? I think the answer should clearly be no. Now, once we recognize the federal government is the issuer of the currency, people then immediately think, oh my God, so you just want the government to, to spend to infinity, right? And the answer is no, you can't do that, right? It isn't that there are no limits, there are limits but the limits are not in the government's ability to afford programs, to make payments, to service bonds and pay debt. The limits are in our real economy. And so this is where I go with chapter two in the book, where we talk about inflation. Because what, what none of us wants is to live in a country where prices are spiraling out of control. Okay, nobody would want that. Inflation is a continuous increase in the price level. And we work very hard to manage inflationary pressure and avoid allowing inflation to, over time, erode the value of the currency. Okay, so in the first chapter, we make sure that we understand government is not like a household. It is not constrained like state and local governments. It has spending capacity well beyond the rest of us by virtue of the fact that it issues the currency, but there are limits and the limits are in our real economy. So if you think about it, our economy runs on sales. We have a capitalist economy. Businesses in a capitalist economy produce for profit, right? They don't, businesses don't hire people because they wanna be good Samaritans, they hire workers because they need them in order to help them produce the output that they can sell and make a profit on, okay? So the question is how much economic activity can our economy support at any one point in time? Businesses would love to be swamped with customers because when a business is swamped with customers, means they have lots of sales, means their revenues are high, means they have a source of profits and profitability and they are viable. Customers start disappearing, sales fall, revenues decline, profits fall, businesses might not survive. You gotta be profitable to stay in business. So the question is, we've got all of these different sources of demand for goods and services that our economy can produce. The private sector has households, you and I, right? We go buy consumer goods and that creates demand for firms products, they like that. Businesses buy from each other, right? They buy uh, intermediate goods, they place orders and so forth. That's good. That drives uh, sales and supports jobs in the economy. Government makes purchases and hires and employs people. And that provides some support for spending in the economy. And then the rest of the world buys some goods and services from us as well. So those are the four ways that demand enters the economy. 
right? Household spending, business spending, government spending, and spending from the rest of the world. The question is, at any point in time, when you add up all of that spending, is it generating enough demand to keep the economy running at full employment, where everybody who wants to work can find a job and the economy is healthy and balanced in a way that you don't have runaway inflation, that the demand is high enough to create enough jobs for people, but not so high that you're outstripping your economy's productive capacity. If demand is running faster than firms can keep up with, then the result is gonna be inflationary pressure. So it's not the only way that you can generate inflation. Okay, inflation is kind of a complicated phenomenon and economists work very hard to try to study and understand inflation and model inflation and think about ways to attenuate inflationary pressures when they arise. But you know, the reality is that across the globe, for a very long period of time, most countries have been struggling to get their inflation rates up, right? That inflation has not been a problem, except to the extent that in places like Japan, they believe that inflation is far, far too low. And governments have been actively trying to stoke inflation. Most countries target inflation at 2%, and most countries put the central bank in charge of basically running macroeconomic policy. So here in the US, Congress told the Federal Reserve, essentially it's your job, you steer the economy, okay? We're not gonna worry too much about it, except in times of crisis, in normal times, you use monetary policy and you adjust interest rates and you try to give us the 2% inflation rate that most central banks are targeting and give us the right amount of unemployment. This is more than I can go into in this short talk, but it's all dealt with in the book. And it's one of the, um, I think, big problems that MMT has with the current approach to macroeconomic policy making is that Congress has put responsibility on the central bank. Okay, these are not elected officials. We didn't vote for the people who are at the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has uh, the ability to run monetary policy independently. Okay, they get to decide how to change interest rates and so forth. Uh, and they get to decide how much unemployment is enough or how much is too much. And so what the Fed does is basically try to find the right number of people to keep unemployed in order to fight inflation. And MMT says there's a better way to do this. We could actually use full employment, genuine full employment, where everybody who wants to work can have a job and it would be a better price anchor, a better way to mitigate inflationary pressures than what we currently do today. And that's a lot to go through and I don't have time, but it may be in the Q&A period, we can talk a little bit more about the mechanics of how the job guarantee or buffer stock employment program or public service employment uh, program, whatever we wanna call it, how that would work. But that's basically um, the idea is to use a federal job guarantee program to achieve genuine full employment while at the same time putting a lid on inflationary pressures or containing inflationary pressures. So running our economy at its full potential. Um, the thing is, it's almost always going to require the government's budget to be in deficit, almost always. And the reason is, and this gets a little bit uh, macro wonky, but there are are demand leakages. You know, every dollar that I save and don't spend is a dollar that some business can't capture as part of their sales, can't become part of their revenue and their profits. Every dollar that's taxed away from me is a dollar that I can't use to buy goods and services in the economy. And every dollar that I use buying goods and services from abroad is a dollar that some US producer can't capture as part of their sales. So those are three forms of demand leakages where I'm not putting pressure on the US economy's productive capacity because that pressure is leaking away, okay? And those leakages make room for other kinds of spending to come into place and to backstop or replace that spending. And one way to do that is through fiscal policy. The government can use tax cuts to try to replace some of the lost spending, or it can spend on its own 
and directly replace some of that lost spending. But the idea is to produce a balanced economy where you have enough total spending to support jobs at full employment, but not so much spending that you're putting too much strain on the productive capacity of the economy and generating inflationary pressures. And what I'm saying is because of the demand leakages, there is almost always a need for the government through deficits to support jobs and um, productive activity in the economy to support the economy. So if so think about it this way, the deficit is the difference between two numbers, right? When we say the government has run a fiscal deficit, we are saying that the government has spent more dollars into the economy than it has subtracted away by taxing us. Okay, that's the government's deficit. Spend 100 in, tax 90 back out, we label that a fiscal deficit. And people get very nervous about that because we've been taught to think about the government's finances the way that we think of our own personal finances. So we say, wait, you're spending more than you're taking in. That's so irresponsible. Stop that, you know, cut it out, balance your budget. But think about what happens if the government balances its budget. So it spends 100 in to the economy and it taxes or removes 100 back out. Well, now the government's budget is balanced, but somebody lost out on 10, right? When they were running a deficit, they put 100 in, spend 100 in, tax 90 back out. That leaves $10 somewhere in the economy. So one of the most important points that MMT makes is that every deficit is good for someone, right? Every deficit is good for someone because the government's deficit is nothing more than a financial contribution to some other part of the economy. In my example, it's a $10 contribution to some other part of the economy. Now, a government surplus, which might sound like the best of all worlds, right? Not only do you balance the government's budget, but you put it into surplus. And we did this during Bill Clinton's administration. From 1998 to 2001, for four years, the federal government's budget moved into surplus. So think about what that means, right? It sounds fiscally responsible. You hear Democrats talk about how they were the last party to deliver not just balanced budgets, but surpluses. And then it was that rotten George Bush who came along and cut taxes and um, you know funded wars. And all of a sudden the surpluses disappeared. Okay, so let's think about whether we really want the federal government's budget in surplus. So what does that mean? Well, it means the government is taxing more dollars out of the economy than it spends back into the economy. So using simple numbers, let's say the government taxes $100 out and it only spends $90 back in. The government's budget is in surplus. We'll write a plus 10 on the government's ledger, but what happened to the rest of the economy? They took 100 away and only replaced 90. So the non-government part of the economy now on its ledger shows a minus 10. So government deficits, I sometimes say, work like a blower, you know, they blow dollars onto somebody's balance sheet. And a government surplus works like a vacuum. You had Hoover's dollars off of people's balance sheets. So the next time you hear a politician railing about fiscal deficits and saying that if you vote for them, they will pledge to balance the budget or put the budget in surplus, I'm talking about the federal government. Next time you hear a federally elected official do this, stop and say to yourself, wait a minute, why is this guy or gal pledging to reduce the surpluses of the rest of the economy, right? Is that, do we really want that? Now, there may be times that uh, the government's budget ought to be in surplus. And it would make sense if you think that uh, the economy is getting too much strain or putting too much strain on the productive capacity then it makes sense for the government to scale back some of its own spending or increase taxes or a combination of the two, right? That's one way to um, temper inflationary pressures. But MMT would never look at the budget outcome itself, surplus deficit balance, and say we should be targeting that, right? You don't know in advance where the government's budget ought to be. You just know in advance what the state of the economy ought to be right? A healthy, full employment economy with 
managed, you know, low inflationary pressures. Okay, so that's um, sort of the goal there. In in economics, there's a chapter in the book. I'm not going to try to talk too much. I, I want to leave lots of time for Q&A. But the wonkiest sort of myth that I get into in the book is the myth that's known in economics as crowding out. And this one is, um, you know, you don't hear this one talked about so much uh, if you turn on the TV or listen to the Sunday morning talk shows, read the newspaper. This one doesn't get the sort of headlines that uh, some of the other myths get. But it's very, very powerful in Washington, D.C. And this myth says that um, government deficits are dangerous because when the government runs a deficit, spends more than it taxes away from us, it has to make up for the shortfall somehow. And it makes up for the shortfall by borrowing from somebody who has money. So the deficit requires the government to borrow from savers. And there's only so much money available to be loaned out. And so when the government wants to borrow more, it leaves fewer dollars available to others to borrow. It's primarily private companies, right? And if the government's deficit gets bigger, then its borrowing needs increase, then it eats up part of the supply of dollars that would have been available to private businesses to invest in our economy. But the government took those dollars and the competition for that finite supply of dollars drives interest rates up. And as interest rates get driven higher, private firms will borrow less because interest is the cost of borrowing. And as private businesses borrow less, we get a less dynamic economy. This is, private businesses are just presumed to um, invest more efficiently and have, you know, greater long-term benefits for the economy, driving productivity, growth, and so forth. And so you get a slower growing, uh, less dynamic economy in the long run as a result of government deficits. So in this chapter, I just basically say, you know, this is like a, a stack of dominoes that the crowding out myth tells you if the government runs a deficit, then it has to borrow. If it has to borrow, then there are fewer savings. If there are fewer savings, then the interest rate goes up because of competition. If the interest rate goes up, then investment goes down. If investment goes down, you get a slower growing economy. So you get that whole string of if thens. And once you tap the first domino, the rest just obediently give way. And the reality is that the, the support, the empirical support for this kind of, um, these assertions or this theory is just not robust. Um, you can get crowding in effects. You can imagine the government making investments in things like education and R&D in infrastructure and having that spending give rise to higher economic activity that then swamps businesses with customers, that then leads businesses to get excited about investing to build more capacity to satisfy higher demand. So the point is, that um, a lot of the myths that we're told, even the more complicated economic myths, um, we, can, we can unpick them and find out where the flaws in the arguments are. So, so much of what we're told to fear about deficits, that governments are going to go broke just like a household would, or I may wrap up on, uh, on this one or uh, one other one, that, that we'll end up like a country like Greece. Okay, many of you probably remember after the financial crisis in 2008 uh, and the global economic recession that followed, that there were, there were debt crises in, across much of Southern Europe that many countries got into to deep trouble. And, you know, I could turn on the nightly news here and I could hear, um, who, uh, let me think, Brian Williams, right? I, would, I could remember standing in the kitchen and hearing the, the scary music come on, like, you know, six o'clock, five o'clock news, whatever. And he goes, dun, dun, dun. And Brian, Brian Williams says, the debt crisis in America. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what debt crisis do we have in America? But the lead in was what was happening in Europe. It was what was happening in Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal and Ireland. And these countries were in trouble. And here we were sitting in the United States looking across and convincing ourselves that if we didn't get serious about reigning in deficits, that we were going to end up just like 
the Greek government, you know, that we were going to have um, debt payments due, that we were not going to be able to make, and so forth and so on. So in the book, I point out the difference between, let's say, the Greek government and the U.S. government. And remember, we started off the conversation recognizing that the federal government of the United States of America is the issuer of the dollar. Problem in Greece and Spain and Italy and others is that these countries, when they joined the Economic and Monetary Union, gave up their sovereign currencies. And when they gave up their sovereign currencies, they adopted a effectively a foreign currency. Okay, these countries are no longer issuers of their own sovereign currency. They are currency users, much like a state in the United States. So these countries were in the same sort of position that Governor Cuomo and Governor Newsom and other uh, governors around the country are in, in that they cannot simply authorize expenditures and know that the payments will be made. They don't issue the currency. So Greece got into trouble. Countries around the world, Venezuela, Argentina, um, Russia, the list is long uh, over a historical period. Countries that borrow in foreign currencies can and do encounter problems with respect to debt. They can miss payments. They can be forced into default. But a country like the U.S., like Australia, like the U.K., like uh, Japan is a perfect example. These are all currency issuing governments and their fiscal capacity is just very different from governments that give up sovereign currencies and start borrowing in currencies that they don't control. Countries that um, like Ecuador or Panama that just outright adopt the U.S. dollar as their currency and they can only operate to the extent that they can earn enough U.S. dollars to keep the public services um, financed. So it is a, a big difference, and I talk about all of that in the book. Um, I'm going to talk about one more topic, and then I would like to go uh, open it up to Q&A. But this topic is really close to my heart because well before I started working on the book, I um, wrote a number of papers on Social Security. And so I have a chapter in the book where I take up Social Security, and I I think it's really important, especially now, because um, you, you know, we are already hearing now with Congress passing multi-trillion dollar spending bills and the deficit is increasing, the national debt is increasing, and the hand-wringing is beginning to start. And that's not good. We definitely do not want lawmakers getting anxious about the impacts of the current economic um, fallout and the spending bills that they've put in place so far to try to support the economy, giving them cold feet prematurely. Because if fiscal support is withdrawn prematurely or if not enough is done, then we as a nation are going to end up with an economy that is um, struggling to recover. We could be looking at a, a period of many, many years where the unemployment rate could be stuck in double digit territory, 10%, 12%, 15%, who knows. Um, but we don't want Congress getting cold feet. And we're already beginning to hear things like, uh, well, now that we've increased the deficit so much, and now that the debt has increased, it's time to start thinking about entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare. And this is often, uh, it's often argued that these are the real drivers of our long-term debt crisis. That, you know, our short-term finances were okay before coronavirus came. Now they're much worse than they were. Um, but in the medium and longer term, we're going to have to start making some tough choices and figuring out um, how we're going to change Social Security or change Medicare so that the government can spend less money because the argument is that these programs are unaffordable. And, you know, again, if you just go back to the first chapter and the first point I made, federal government of the United States of America is the issuer of the dollar. It's the issuer of the dollar it can never run out of money. It can never have bills coming due that it can't afford to pay. So think about what that means for Social Security. Okay, Social Security is a program that provides um, financial benefits to not just retirees, but to their dependents in many cases and to the disabled. 
So the federal government has um, created a program that is an automatic entitlement program in the sense that once you qualify for the benefits, you're in the program and the benefit payments are supposed to be made to you. There are people who believe that the federal government can't afford to keep its promises, that the system is running out of money. There are trust funds that are set up. Think of that as a sort of piggy bank or a savings account where someone has stuffed dollars in, locked them into place with the intention of releasing them in future years to pay retirees as our aging society. Uh, the demographics are such that workers are moving out of the workforce and into retirement. And as they go on to Social Security, we're supposed to make benefit payments to them. People say we can't afford to do it. Uh, there's not enough cash being paid into the system to allow the federal government to meet its obligations in full in perpetuity. To which I say, it, why would you worry about trapping dollars in a trust fund like locking up digital spreadsheet entries and thinking that somehow that's what makes you able to meet future obligations. That if we don't tie up enough dollars, trap them on a spreadsheet somewhere, then we won't be able to mail benefit checks or send the dollars out in the future to retirees. That's obviously very silly. So the federal government can afford to keep its promise to every future retiree, their dependents and the disabled with or without this thing called a trust fund with or without dollars locked up digital, right? They don't even exist in physical form. We're just numbers, you know, typed into a computer keyboard that show up in this thing we call the trust fund. The challenge is think again about where the limits are. It's our economy's real productive capacity. It's our real resources. Inflation is the thing to worry about. So if we're looking into the future and we see the demographic changes taking place, we say the US workforce is shrinking because we're an aging society. People are moving out of the workforce and into retirement. Once they retire, they're no longer working and producing goods and services, but they still consume goods and services. So they wanna buy some of what's produced. The question then becomes, if we keep our promises, if the government keeps its promise to all future beneficiaries, sends those checks out, will people who receive those benefit payments be able to turn around and spend that money back into the economy without creating undue inflationary pressure, unwanted accelerating inflation? That's the risk to manage. It's not we won't be able to afford to keep promises. Of course, we can afford to keep promises. The question is, and this is what politicians really should be wrestling. If they want to have a fight, have a good fight, have a meaningful fight, right? Figure out who's got the best ideas for the kinds of investments that we need to make in our economy today to make sure that in 10, 20, 30 years, the US economy is productive enough that when those benefit payments go out, we're able to produce enough stuff, right? The goods and services so that the working population and the retired population can all spend money into an economy where it's able to keep up with that demand, where there's enough productive capacity, enough supply so that we can have a full employment economy. Everybody gets the output that they want. It can be produced without inflationary pressure. So, you know, if I had to say in a nutshell, and I want to wind up so we can do Q&A, what is the point of MMT? MMT is about replacing artificial, artificial, phony constraints with a real resource constraint, which is an inflation constraint. And by the way, and it's also in the book, a real, uh, a natural resource constraint, right? An ecological constraint, a bio uh, economic constraint that we can't place excessive pressures on our factories and machines and on our planet and expect uh, things to work out well for us. So it's about getting away from an obsession with the stuff that doesn't matter and turning our attention to the things that do matter. And so chapter 10, uh, chapter 10, I didn't write cha 10 chapters. I wrote eight. Chapter seven is called the deficits that matter. And that's where I really hope that we can start turning more of our attention to the, the legitimate deficits that are um, pervasive in our economy. So with that, I think I will stop 
and look to take um, some of the questions that you all have submitted. Mm, let me give a quick look here. Well, Jeff, Jeff asks, uh, how can the American public be educated about MMT to build political support? I think that's a great question, Jeff. And um, I'm not an organizer, but I know a lot of good ones and I know how important that work is. Um, you know, I think that it has to be a multifaceted effort. It, it can't be, we're not going to spread uh, a better understanding, as it spread, bad word. Uh, we're not going to achieve a better understanding, better public discourse without you know, journalists playing an important role. They're the ones who sit down with politicians and if the first question out of their mouth is, how are you gonna pay for it? And then haranguing them over the numbers and whether the math adds up and whether it will add to the deficit, that's not helpful. We need journalists to start asking better questions. So if somebody says, you know, I want Medicare for all, don't say, how are you gonna pay for it? Say, well, are you sure we have the doctors and nurses, the long-term care facilities, will we have the uh, mental health professionals, will we have the hospital beds, will we have the infrastructure, the real resources to produce and to make good on that promise of Medicare for all or whatever the case may be, tuition-free college, right? Um, you have to have people on the ground. You have to have, uh, I think, people like me. Um, you know, We have to teach better and we have to teach each other and we have to have discourse on a whole bunch of different fronts. So. Um, I like that question a lot. It's just, it's not easy to get there. I'm doing my part. Uh, how much debt is too much is one of the questions. And how do we know when we get there? So I didn't really get to, I didn't get to spend a lot of time on any one subject, but um, on the debt, the the debt is, is just a misnomer in some respects. It's got a rotten, um, calling card. And I say this in the book, you know, because people think, well, there's too much debt. And this is what this question is about. The national debt, this thing we call the national debt, is nothing more than a historic record of all the past instances where the government spent more money, more dollars into the economy than it taxed back out. And those dollars are currently sitting in the form of U.S. Treasuries government securities okay that's the that's the name we've given to it sucks frankly um we call it the national debt and it's just a stockpile of treasury securities that you could think of as part of the u.s net money supply you can just think of it as part of the money supply part of our money supply is interest bearing and part of it is non-interest bearing treasuries are interest-bearing dollars. So if the question is how many interest-bearing dollars are too many interest-bearing dollars, then my answer is, well, it depends. Are they creating a, any kind of problem? Okay. Are they creating inflationary pressures? If you've got interest-bearing dollars out there and somebody's being paid interest income, I'm a bondholder, right? So suppose I have bonds. And because I hold bonds, I'm being paid interest income. And that interest income then allows me to spend more, right? So if all of the bondholders are getting all of this interest income and those dollars start going out and chasing goods and services and the economy's productive capacity is already at its maximum, then you could get inflationary pressure. So the answer to the question, how much debt is too much, is when the, when the debt becomes a problem is when it starts to give rise to inflationary pressures. And that's how you know when you get there and you can manage that okay um please elaborate on how the pandemic response of funding uh oops the question jumped uh the elites and corporations four or five trillion exposes the lie that deficits even matter okay so that's a good question um he, so here's a here's what happened and i know the person who asked the question knows but just for everybody else to make sure we're all on the same page um you know, we just not too long ago got through uh, 2019 and for pretty much the whole of that year, we um, 
watched a very crowded field of Democrats, Democratic hopefuls, presidential hopefuls, um, pitching their platforms and saying, you know, vote for me, I'd like to be president, and these are the things I would like to do. And at every turn, the question that dogged candidates, and those with more ambitious platforms really got it, right? But everybody got it, was how are you gonna pay for it? How are you gonna pay for it? How are you gonna pay? Where's the money gonna come from? How are you gonna finance this stuff? And people twisted themselves in knots to try to say, well, we can find revenue here and we can raise taxes there and we can come up with all the money we need. And then roll the clock forward to March of this year and the coronavirus pandemic begins. And all of a sudden, dollars are materializing out of Congress, legislation is being passed left and right. Nobody paused for a second to say, how are we gonna pay for it? Whose taxes have to go up? Where is the money gonna come from? Congress wrote and passed bills left and right for in, in very short order. And I think what this question uh, from David is about is doesn't that just expose what a farce this whole pay for game was all through 2019 listening to this question about how there's no money for anything can't afford to do any of these things and now we're congress is authorizing trillions uh and you know the house has passed a bill for another three trillion which the senate uh has yet to show uh, an appetite for but the point is we can very quickly come up with four, five, six, and more trillion. And in, is that, in some sense, a vindication of the sort of stuff I've been talking about? That's the question here. And I think the answer is yes. I think it's a, a very good real world, real time example of exactly how Congress can and does pay for things when they deem there to be a sufficiently urgent need. Okay, If there's a priority, they will fund it. If they're not funding something, it's not because there's no money, it's because they've decided it's not a sufficiently high priority, okay? They just don't wanna fund it. Um, please talk about the ideology of deficits. I think I, I, think I might've hit that one, Martha, um, throughout. Let's see, what is the need? Okay, here's one. What's the need, if any, of having federal income taxation under MMT? So if what I've been saying is that the government is the issuer of the currency, doesn't need to get the dollar from anyone else in order to spend, doesn't rely on tax revenue, doesn't rely on savers to finance um, borrowing uh, and deficit spending, um, then what's the purpose of taxes? Why do we even have them? So this is more than I can do in the time that remains, but in the book, I, I go through this in a lot of detail. Uh, but one thing clearly is that if the government was simply authorizing spending bills and suspending taxes, like no, I'm not going to tax anything back, I'm only going to spend dollars into the economy, we'd pretty quickly run up against that inflation constraint, right? So the, the spending creates new dollars. Every time the government spends a dollar, it is new money creation. Those dollars are newly created, digitally minted dollars. And when the government taxes, it's retiring those dollars, okay? So the, the question is about the, the push and the pull. Okay? How many are we pushing into the economy and how many are being pulled back out of the economy? You need to pull something back out and that's for preventing accelerating inflationary pressure. How many need to be pulled back out? That's a function of the demand leakages that I talked about earlier. Um, I know it seems like it'd be really nice for all of us if we just didn't have to pay income taxes at all, but it does help not just manage inflationary pressures, but because of the progressivity of our income tax system, it also helps, but not enough, I would argue, um, with um, preventing the distribution of income from being even more extreme than what it already is today. Um, yeah, so there's a question about climate change and it jumped too because y'all are typing and then things kind of skip upwards. Um, yeah, can, how can MMT function, Lina asks, alongside or contribute to calls to pursue degrowth or you know a growth in response to growth associated climate change. I, I mean, I spend a lot of time in the book 
on climate change in the chapter called The Deficits That Matter and in the closing chapter to the book. I think this is uh, critically important. Um, yeah, climate change is an existential threat. That is my position. So I think it has to be dealt with. Um, when I talk about the economy's productive capacity, remember I'm also talking about the climate's capacity to handle it. The goal of MMT is not to maximize growth. It is, in fact, I think that so much of the um, growth obsession is bound up in the debt obsession because people often think that the way to get yourself out of a debt problem, if you think the debt is a problem, which I don't, but if you think the debt is a problem, people often say, well, the way to deal with it is to grow your way out of debt, see? And so they look at a ratio where the debt is in the numerator and GDP is in the denominator. So it's the debt to GDP ratio. And if you wanna bring the ratio down, you just juice the denominator. You grow your economy as fast as you can so that the ratio will come down. And then people say, oh, we're growing our way out of debt. But if you don't view the debt as some sort of existential threat, then you don't you can let go of that growth obsession because you don't view growth as the solution to your debt crisis. Um, and you can start recognizing, I think, which is what Lynn is asking about, that we can function perfectly well with low growth or degrowth and have a healthy, habitable, thriving um, economy and and planet and society. So anyway, it's dealt with in much more detail in the book. Um, what metaphors? Uh, that's an interesting question. And I don't see the name of the person, but what metaphors will help us understand modern money and what old metaphors should we jettison? So I think communication is, is key. I really do. Uh, I think framing matters a lot. I think that a, a lot of the damage that's been done to all of us is accomplished through clever um, turn of phrase, through framing. You know, when people say um, the debt is going to, you know, you're s stealing from your children and grandchildren. Hey, that's framing. That those are metaphors. Okay, borrowing from China. Those are little phrases that very quickly tap into our insecurities about, you know the outside world or fear of hurting our children and grandchildren or something like that. So I try in the book um, to introduce new different framing, new metaphors. One of my favorites, I think, is um, trying to say that, you know, the goal should not be to force your economy to balance your budget, but instead to use the budget to balance your economy. And so there's a, a, a figure in the book where I show the scales, you know, sort of like the scales of justice, the scales and government spending is heavier than taxes. So you have the government running a deficit, but your economy is in balance. You have full employment and you have stable prices. So I want to call this a balanced budget because it delivers the economic outcome, the balanced economy that I think we should be after. So I, I'm always playing with this because I think it, it really does matter. Um, and helping to give politicians new and more constructive ways to carry on discourse about government finances. Um, is, I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, if the Fed uses unemployment as a measure for inflation, it jumped again, duck on it. Uh, I started to read and then it jumped. Hmm. I don't know what the question was. I'm so sorry. It, it popped out of view. There it is. Wouldn't a guaranteed live? Okay. If the Fed uses unemployment as a measure for inflation, wouldn't a guaranteed livable income have kept inflation at a healthy percentage? So the Fed maintains a certain amount of slack in the labor market. This is how they would describe it. And that a certain number of people are kept unemployed for the sake of preventing the labor market from getting too tight. And the idea is when it becomes too easy for people to find jobs, when the labor market gets too tight, workers have more bargaining power, 
They can negotiate higher wages, and if wages increase, then employers might respond to the increased wages um, by raising prices to protect the profit margins. And so higher wages push prices higher, and then you get inflation, and then you can even have a, a wage price spiral if um, the bargaining intensifies. Um, so the question is, could you somehow avoid that? Remember, we don't have uh, inflation accelerating. Um, could you avoid that with a guaranteed livable income? I assume this person's asking about something like a universal basic income or something like that. Uh, there are proposals right now to get cash payments to virtually everybody in the country. Um, and given the slack conditions in the economy, uh, there is scope. There is definitely capacity to do some of that. Uh, I would have to know more about how much and for whom and under what conditions. But, um, you know, our, the MMT preferred way to handle unemployment is just more targeted, right? So that the dollars go not to everyone in a blanket, not targeted fashion, but that you target the spending directly to the unemployed get the dollars in the hands of people who are looking for jobs but locked out of uh, employment and employ them, put them to work doing socially useful things, things that um, enhance the community, enhance the planet, um, caring for people, caring for planet, caring for um, our communities. So um, I'm not, we're, none of us I think are opposed to some form of basic income support especially for those who can't or shouldn't be in the workplace. Uh, and that could include some home care work as well. So um, I think with that, it's 10 o'clock and um, it, I'll take one last question. The, the, the last one, and this is a great question, is, is GDP, it jumped, <laughs> is GDP a good, way to measure, I think, uh, okay, is the GDP a useful measure of the economy? Great question, Norm. Um, it's, it's useful in some respects, but it definitely has its, short, it's, has its shortcomings. There's an uh, Australian economist um, who has developed an alternative indicator, and he calls it the genuine progress indicator. Uh, his name is Phil, uh, Phil Lawn. I hope I'm getting that right. Philip Lawn, I believe. And his genuine progress indicator says, look, GDP has all these shortcomings. There are lots of costs and lots of benefits that aren't captured in this measure of um, economic output or economic activity. So we can improve upon that and we can get things uh, in there that give us a better sense of our genuine economic well-being. And he's just one example. So. Um, it's the dominant, but I think that lots of economists are working on alternative measures of well-being. So thank you all for, um, for joining for this whole hour conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I'll be doing more of these. So if you didn't get your question answered tonight, maybe there will be other forums and you can pop over and get your question answered there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for everybody uh, tuning in this evening. And I also want to thank uh, Professor Kelton for being here. If you enjoyed this event, you can find many more just like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. We also hope that you'll consider making a donation to Town Hall Seattle as your support will continue to allow us uh, to provide events just like this one. If you're interested in, making, uh, in purchasing a copy of the book, The Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory and the Birth of the People's Economy, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company. Uh, finally, I wanna thank everybody again for being here tonight and I hope you have a great evening.